Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Killed Me Smalls podcast. This guy right here is a guy that you know. Pretty famous dude, Kenny Albert. Kenny, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be with you, Mike. It's ironic, uh, as we were chatting before the podcast started, uh, the last interview we did was in early March 2020 during my last road trip prior yep. to the pause of the NHL and the NBA season. And it's hard to believe that's almost a year ago. You and I talked at the uh, Sixers-Knicks game, and then the next day you headed on that road trip, and then all hell broke loose. It's amazing uh, what's happened. What it, What is, you know, it's funny. I watch a lot of these, uh, obviously, watching sports is the uh, is the only thing we can do that's interesting. You know, we went several weeks without being able to do that. But when I watch people in your job, I think about, you know, everybody thinks about how the players play without fans. What about what about announcing a game when nobody's there, or or maybe there have been times when you weren't even there? Well, it's been such a bizarre eleven months, Mike. Um, obviously, everything shut down on March thirteenth, fourteenth, and mm -hmm. uh, all of us were home uh, for many months. Uh, for me, it was one hundred forty six straight days at home from March thirteenth until uh, early August when I left for Edmonton for the NHL playoffs in the bubble. And uh, that was obviously the l most amount of time that I've ever been home. Uh, usually so busy with uh, whether it's home And you're games, still married, travel, right? Travel, still married. So it worked uh, out. <laughs> my wife and kids, you know, we spent more time together during that stretch than we ever have. My yeah. kids are 18 and 21, similar age to yours. And yep. uh, we had never spent that much time together. So we would have dinner at home every night. We would watch movies and TV shows and uh Again, it was really such a surreal time. And then the NHL started up again, as you know, in early August. Mm -hmm. And I worked for about a week uh, locally out of studios, calling games off monitors. Uh, the New York Rangers, I do their radio, so they were in the playoffs against Carolina for three games. I worked some NBC hockey games out of Stanford, Connecticut, out of the studio. So that was different, calling games off TV monitors, really for the first time. But then I headed up to Edmonton to the bubble for NBC, and I was there for 37 days. And that was personally a terrific experience, uh, having the opportunity to work so many playoff games in such a short time. Uh, it was the first time on an airplane in months. So I flew to Edmonton, and as per the uh, NHL and Canadian government protocols, uh, I quarantined for four days in a hotel room when I arrived, as everybody else did. And... Uh, watched a lot of hockey on TV. Fortunately, there were games going on from 10 in the morning until midnight. So I was able to watch games, uh, spent a lot of time on the phone, on FaceTime, on the computer, getting work done, reading, watching movies and TV shows. Uh, so a four-day quarantine. And then for the next 32 or 33 days, I was calling uh, one, two, or even three games a day. I think it was a total of 34 games in Edmonton, in the bubble. So that was certainly a unique experience. I don't think people understand how hard that is. I mean, it's it's pretty tiring to call, a, you know, a two and a half, three hour game. And then to have to do that two or three times in a day, That's that had to take a lot out of you. You know, I think the adrenaline carried us through for the most part. Uh, there were two three game days and that was just so much fun. When else do you get the opportunity to call three NHL playoff games in one day? Um, the, as far as the you know, the, the tiring aspect of it. The good thing is we weren't traveling. We were in the same hotel. There were no right. flights. So you didn't have that uh, aspect of it. You weren't getting up early to take flights from city to city. You were in one place uh, for 37 days. And by the bubble, what I mean is there was a large fence about 10 feet high surrounding the two hotels where the teams, the staff, the broadcasters were all staying and the arena. And you could not leave that area, um, except they had bus. Uh, they had a bus every day back and forth. If you wanted to go to the CFL football stadium to get some exercise, that was considered part of the bubble because it was a secure bus for only folks inside the bubble. They would literally drive inside the stadium, and the only people allowed in were those of us in the bubble. They had security. So um, I did that once. I kicked the soccer ball around, threw a football, <laughs> did some laps. Some other people, you know, ran and walked up the steps uh, multiple times. So it was good to get some fresh air and get outside. But um, it was great. I was there through the conference final, Western Conference final. Then came back home in early September, and it was on to the NFL. 
and we did travel uh, with the NFL on Fox every weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. I did have a couple of local games involving the Jets or the Giants. Drove to Washington a few times, but everything else was was uh, flights on a Friday and returning home on a Sunday. And I think the airlines and hotels did a great job. Uh, Delta, for example, left every other seat open so you weren't next to somebody yeah. else. Everybody wore the masks. The hotels were pretty empty. Now, working the games, uh, the preparation was a lot different. Uh, we did not go to practices. We did not meet with players and coaches in person. We did that over Zoom, which I thought went pretty well. Yeah, You know uh, what? How, how much of a difference does that make, honestly? I mean, you know, I, I've always felt that it's better in person when you're with someone in a room. Yeah. But obviously, we couldn't do that due to the circumstances. And I think all the players and coaches that we spoke with were so accommodating. And it, it did go pretty well. Um, so I think that could be how a lot of things uh, work in the future. You know, I, I never even heard of Zoom until last no. March. Now we yeah, I wish we bought the stock day. a year ago, right? Now, I have. I had a new partner this past year, Jonathan Vilma, my broadcast partner on mm -hmm. Fox. So we never actually met until our first weekend together down in Atlanta. We had had some Zoom calls amongst our crew. We actually did a rehearsal game, a practice game via Zoom, believe it or not. We were all in different locations. And we met for the first time in Atlanta when we got together to do that first game. And in normal times, from Friday morning until Sunday, you're with your crew, your color analyst, your sideline reporter, your producer, director, the other production folks, pretty much the entire weekend. You're at practice on Friday. Mm -hmm. You go to lunch together. You have dinner together. You're in the hotel on Saturday. You have lunch and dinner, and, and you go to a, a meeting with the visiting team at their hotel. But we didn't do any of that this year. You know, we, we had to keep our distance and stay to ourselves. So a lot of our communication was on the phone, via email, text, Zoom, et cetera. Uh, we would get together on Saturday for a, a socially distanced production meeting in the hotel. And that was it. And then as opposed to normal times where we would all pile into one car to go to the stadium or to the airport after the game, we all rented our own cars. We traveled separately. Uh, once we arrived at the stadium and went up to the broadcast, but that was really the only place we can go. We weren't allowed to go to the field to congregate and smooth with others. We had to go right to the broadcast booth. There were only six or seven people in the booth all spread out. We had plexiglass between us. Mm -hmm. And then calling games in, in mostly empty stadiums. I had done it in Edmonton during the hockey playoffs, so I had a little bit of experience. Um, we had some fans in certain cities. We did two Steelers games, so they had 5,000 fans at each game. We actually did the Cowboys-Eagles game week 16, and I think they had 30,000 in Dallas for that game. Um, but there were other games with empty stadiums. So as a broadcaster, I really had to remind myself to keep up the energy and enthusiasm we had some piped in crowd noise, but it's not the same as when you have 70,000 people in the stadium. And yeah. then once hockey and basketball started up in late December, early January, I'm working home games uh, for the Rangers and, and certain games for the Knicks at Madison Square Garden in an empty arena. Uh, they are going to start allowing fans next week on February 23rd for the Knicks, February 26th for the Rangers. And then the away games we've worked out of the studio uh, at MSG. And at the radio studio. So that's all. So what is that like? I mean, you know, we've all, you know, we've all sat in front of our televisions thinking we can do play by play. But, you know, I, and I watch some of the local broadcasts here and, and I, th I think they do a pretty good job. You know, sometimes it, it's like they're a beat late for certain things or um, but it's it's all in all pretty good. What what is that like to, to well, do? A game? You know, it, it brought a lot of us back to our childhood, Mike, when right. we to call games off off television. I think. For the Not just childhood. Player. Is it bad that I still do that in my 50s? There you go. I'm sure nah. many others do as well. <laughs> um, I think we, we as broadcasters know the difference if you're not in the building, if you're doing it off a monitor. I think the average viewer, aside from maybe noticing a little bit of a delay at times, might not notice that it's that much different than if we were in the building. The viewers might not realize we're not in the building, aside from when we mention it. I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. I think they've done a really good job. I think for the most part, I think for the most part, everyone has done a great job. Um, you know, for me as a play-by-play -play broadcaster, if I'm working a hockey game off a monitor, you won't necessarily see every penalty that takes place, for example, away from the play. Yeah. It might take two or three seconds to realize that 
the referee has his arm up, he might not be in the shot on your monitor that you're looking at. And I've noticed in basketball too, uh, they sometimes the the play by play announcers sometimes struggle with you know who the fouls on. Exactly, you can't really who see him go twenty two right. or twenty one right. or whatever. Yeah, and that was my next thought. The yeah, foul, if there's a technical foul called, um, if you're at the game, you could you're a lot closer and you could see the numbers yeah. like you said. So I think that's been in basketball. Uh, uh, that's been the one thing that might take a few extra seconds, the foul or a technical foul or something else rules wise that's going on. Now the official after all, all those weeks that we went without sports, I mean, I think, you know, people would be nitpicky to complain about that. <laughs> right. I think I feel like as a play by play broadcaster, I could probably do, if I had to put a number on it, 85% of the job that I would do if I were at the game, if I were actually calling it in person, there, there are definitely things that you miss. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have that crowd and the energy. And in hockey, for example, you won't necessarily see the line changes when the players come onto the ice. Um, you know, in basketball, usually you'll see the substitutions because it's during a dead ball. So they'll show the players coming into the game. But the other thing, I give the production folks a lot of credit because uh, they're not traveling either in the NBA or NHL. So the producer, the director, the graphics folks, the replay folks, they're back in the home city taking a feed from the home team's uh, telecast. So it's a lot more challenging for the production folks as well. Um, but again, we'll all get through it. Hopefully by next season, we're back to normal, calling every game in the arena. But uh, my, my opinion is it's great that the, the leagues are playing. Uh, football got through an entire season. Baseball got through with a couple of uh, blips here and there. Uh, hockey and basketball, we've seen a lot of games canceled and some teams sitting out. But um, – even when those situations have occurred, you still have 25 or 26 other teams that are still playing. So I think, right. uh, you know, the leagues have done a terrific job with the health and safety protocols and uh, all of our networks and uh, employers have as well. And uh, hopefully with the vaccine, um, you know, and some other, uh, uh, you know, help from the medical community, you know, hopefully we'll all get through this pretty soon and be back to normal by next year. Yeah, let's hope. You know what I'd really like to explore a little bit. You know, you really talked about your your new partner in football, Jonathan Vilma, who, by the way, I thought was really good. I thought um, he did a terrific job. I did too. What about some of the relationships that you built when you're sitting in that bubble for a couple of months in Edmonton? You had to get to know some people that you probably didn't get to know in the past. Um, any good stories about people that uh, surprised you? That's a great question. Uh, we were in such a small area and it was players coaches general managers team staff broadcasters television personnel uh league officials and then the on ice officials the referees and the linesmen and i did build relationships with some of them um uh, we were we were tested every day inside the bubble so i took 37 straight COVID tests in my room during the quarantine and then at the arena everybody in the bubble was tested every day. So we felt so safe. I felt like mm -hmm. I was in the safest place in North America. Now we did have to wear masks everywhere aside from when we were working or aside from when the players were playing, you still wore masks, but we also had meals with our colleagues. So we were able to go to restaurants in the hotels and in the arena and have meals and take our masks off to eat. And like I said, everybody was tested every day and there were no positive tests. So we really felt safe. But you did form relationships. Um, I knew a couple of the referees and linesmen, but they were in the same hotel. So we wound up after the games every night at the same restaurant and would spend a lot of time together. So you got to know these guys. Um, I would bump into players and coaches in um, uh, non-work settings. There give, was give me one story, one story that you heard from a, a player, a coach, or a linesman, or you know, uh, any kind of official about, about any well, game, any crazy story. Give well, me one good things. story. One of the officials told me that because the arena was empty with no fans, he was able to hear me doing play by play while he was on the ice working the game. <laughs> Our booth was about 20 rows up. We had a great location right on the concourse. So apparently my play by play carried down to the ice and the official actually heard it at one point. Um, I played a lot of ping pong in the bubble. They had ping pong tables in the arena, in the hotels. And I would take on all challengers. I'm not sure what it says about me that ping pong might be my best sport athletically. Um, <laughs> so I had uh, one colleague of mine. We, we would get together every day around lunchtime and play for about an hour. And uh, that was actually. Now, was really anybody doing play-by-play -play while you were it, playing? I, I was in my head. 
but it was, a, head, it was okay. a great it was a great form of exercise believe it or not even though it's a confined area you, you're moving around you get sweaty and we couldn't really go for long walks you couldn't go outside the fencing outside the bubble yeah. so i felt like i was exercising by playing ping pong uh one of the referees chris rooney great nhl referee one of the best works the stanley cup final uh several times uh you know over the past five or ten years and uh he happened to be walking by the ping pong table at one point and he joined in and uh, we were both very competitive. I think I beat him in the first game and then he beat me in the next two and we played a couple more times later on. So uh, got to play ping pong with some of the officials and it was a lot of fun just getting to know these guys. I would bump into coaches, um, John Cooper of the Tampa Bay Lightning, Barry Trotz of the Islanders, who I've known for many, many years. We worked minor league hockey together in Baltimore um, Pete DeBoer of the Vegas Golden Knights. We would see these guys in the plaza area uh, during off times, and they had some food trucks set up, and uh, players, coaches, staff would be sitting outside, you know, reading a book, looking at their phone, watching videos, talking to other guys. So uh, you did get to bump into some folks a little bit more often than you would during normal times. So you do play-by-play for the Knicks with Clyde Frazier. How fun is that? I I actually, you know, full disclosure, as you know, I follow the Sixers, but I do enjoy watching Clyde on TV. Uh, What's he like off camera? He's the best. I I get to work about 20 games a year with Clyde. Um, I do Rangers on radio for MSG. And then when Mike Breen has a national broadcast uh, with ESPN or ABC, they slide me over onto the Knicks TV side. So it's about 20 games a year. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. Uh, Clyde is such a unique personality. I grew up watching him play. I mean, he won his first championship. I was two years old in 1970. And I remember watching him throughout the seventies. I vaguely recall the 73 championship team. So he was a guy that I heard so much about throughout my childhood and to have the opportunity to work with him over the last 10 years. Uh, first of all, Mike, he's, he's so, so kind, uh, to fans, uh, when, when there are fans in the building. I've seen that and we're on the road and fans of all ages come over to ask for a Mm -hmm. picture or for an autograph. He never says no, never once have I seen him turn down an autograph or uh, a photo opportunity or just a quick request to chat. Um, The younger fans probably don't even know that he was a player. They only know him as a broadcaster. Mm. Uh, He's appeared in commercials and movies and TV shows, and he's famous for his rhyming on the broadcast, his soliloquy. But when the 40, 50, 60, 70-year-old fans come over, they always have an anecdote about remembering uh, watching him play. Um, on the air, he does a great job. He, he watches he so much basketball. He watches so much basketball on TV, you could tell, because he'll point out things about other teams and players uh, in other games, and he watches college basketball as well. And he has a unique style. Uh, of all the analysts that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with over 200 in the various sports, I might hold the all-time record. He has such a unique style, but he does a great job. The fans in New York absolutely love him. He's a treasure at Madison Square Garden. His number's retired. You know, everybody talks about the Willis Reed game, game seven in 1970 Mm -hmm. when the Knicks beat the Lakers to win the championship, and Willis Reed was limping onto the court and hit his first two shots and was so inspirational. He was the captain of the Knicks and he and Clyde were great friends and, and roommates at times and uh, still uh, keep in touch and, and have a tremendous friendship. But uh, others are pretty quick to point out that Clyde probably played his best game uh, that night. Yep. Uh, 36 points. I think it was 17 assists and nine rebounds. So after Willis Reed hit those first two shots, Clyde took over and led the Knicks to that championship in 1970. But he's such a wonderful human being. Um, and like I said, so kind to everybody that he comes in contact with. Speaking and of course, of, of course, the outfits that, that he wears. Uh, yeah, do you have, has he given you a fur coat? Uh, he, do you have a score or anything that you uh, sport? There, there's an Instagram account, Clyde So Fly, on Instagram <laughs> and Twitter, where this gentleman posts pictures every broadcast off the television screen of, whatever outfit Clyde is wearing, and he gives him a grade from A-plus all the way down to C or D, <laughs> depending on the outfit every night. But you didn't answer my question. Do you have a fedora or a fur coat that, that I, I do not. Worn? I do not have. You know, okay. I, I've always joked when we do our opening segment before the games, I could be wearing a T-shirt and shorts, and nobody would know. Nobody's me. looking. They're all, yeah. they're all looking at Clyde. Nobody's looking at me. But hey, I, do, I do make sure to 
uh, have photos taken frequently. So on my phone, I get a, I, I, I have a nice laugh whenever I look back at some of the outfits that Clyde wore during some of the telecasts. You know, speaking of the Knicks, they, they've been pretty fun. I want to get into that after we do one quick break here. Um, Kenny, as you know, my, my daughter has a brain tumor. Uh, she was diagnosed when she was 14 years old. She's 17 now. She underwent um, about 16 months of chemotherapy and is doing great. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's inoperable. And we have to go back every four to six months and get an MRI. She's actually going back next week and make sure that it hasn't grown. And, and um, you know, as long as it doesn't grow, all is well. But, you know, there's definitely that anxiety every time. And she knows what a lot of these kids go through during that time when they have to get chemotherapy, when they first get diagnosed. And she's taken it upon herself to start a charity called Small Miracles. And it's now been designated with a 501c3. And you can donate to it. She's raised over thirty thousand dollars in the last year, and has given you know gift bags to the children at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that are diagnosed and on chemotherapy. And her new mission is to get these kids iPads. And we're going back next Wednesday with a shipment of iPads for the, some of the money she's raised. You can buy clothing, you can buy masks, um, or you can donate. Go to smallmiraclesinc.org. And you can read about her journey, you can donate, or you can buy some gear. It's a great cause and everything goes right to the kids and it's just straight from her heart. She's doing amazing and doing amazing things and uh, she's changing the world one day at a time. So getting back to you, the Knicks are kind of fun all of a sudden. I'll tell you, Julius Randle has an all-star case. Um, It's a shame that the Garden fans aren't there to see quickly. They would love him. Uh, what do you think about some of the juice coming back to the Knicks? Well, first of all, before I get to the Knicks, uh, I want to send your daughter the best and glad to hear she's doing well and, and she's doing great things, uh, as far as the charity works. So, uh, yeah, continued success with that and, uh, hope to meet her next time I get to a game down in Philadelphia. Once the fans are allowed back in. Yeah. I'll bring her her so you can meet her for sure. She comes to a few games with me a year. If I'm down there for a Knicks game uh, at some point against the Sixers, we'll have to set her up for a picture with Clyde as well. No we'll doubt. Do that. She'll have no idea why, but we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have met to do it. Al out the lobby. That was cool to her. <laughs> yeah, Al is a great guy. Yeah. Um, as far as the Knicks, uh, they've had a really fun season. Uh, they have a record of 14 and 16 as we tape this uh, podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom Thibodeau's done a tremendous job. Change the culture. Uh, Right. He changed. Absolutely. And uh, they brought in a couple of South Jersey guys uh, to run the team. Leon Rose from the Cherry Hill area and Mm -hmm. William Wesley. And uh, they have a long uh, standing relationship with Tom Thibodeau. And uh, they've done an outstanding job. Uh, You mentioned Julius Randle. He's definitely had an all star. I love him out of college and you really see him developing. Looks like a different player. Uh, Cuddy Payne is one of the assistant coaches who worked with. John Calipari at Kentucky mm-hmm. when Julius Randle was there. And the Knicks have four players from Kentucky on their roster. And uh, Kenny Payne has gotten a lot of credit for the work that he's done with Julius Randle. Uh, you mentioned Emmanuel Quickly, the rookie out of Kentucky. Yep. Uh, picked with the 25th selection in the first round. The Knicks had two picks. Uh, Obi Toppin was their first round pick out of Dayton. Quickly's had a, a fabulous rookie season to this point. Uh, Mitchell Robinson was having a terrific mm-hmm. year defensively. Unfortunately, broke his thumb last week so he's out four to six weeks but they plugged in a former sixer nerland's noel Mm -hmm. into that starting center spot he's in the top 10 in the league and block shots um rj barrett continues to improve in his second year alfred payton's had a nice year and then they reacquired derrick rose last week who has a long relationship with tom thibodeau uh both in chicago when he won the mvp he was the youngest mvp at the age of 22 and then he played for thibodeau in minnesota as well so they're you remember when he got hurt, when he had that first injury? That was against right. the Sixers in the playoffs. And, right, so they're uh, reunited for the third time. Yeah. So it's, it's He's a, a culture team. changer, for he sure. It's a, it's a fun team to watch. Alec Burks, another former Sixer, has done a nice job off the bench. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what Thibodeau has done is he's instilled that work ethic, uh, the defensive mentality uh, for a good portion of this season. And I'm not sure where the numbers are today, but at least as of three or four days ago, The Knicks were first in the league in fewest points allowed per game, uh, opponent field goal percentage, and opponent 
uh, three point percentage. So in all those defensive categories, they've been first in the league. Now they're also all towards the bottom. Yep. They're towards the bottom offensively, but they've been able to win the low score in close games. So, Hey, Kenny, I know I've got to let you go in two minutes. I have one. We got a bunch of mailbag questions. I'm going to hit you with one on the way out. Um, Well, first of all, I know that, uh, that your dad, the famous Marv Albert has uh, talked about starting to wind it down. What an amazing career he's had. But the mailbag question that I have for you is you do NFL games, you do hockey games, you do basketball games. When you have time, and you're just sitting around in your house, you know, and the kids have something to do. Are you watching a movie? Or are you watching a ball game? And what do you choose to watch? I'm usually watching a game of some sort. Uh, not that I don't enjoy movies, and especially during the pandemic. Uh, like, do you get the thing from your wife? Like, good Lord, you've been doing this all week, and now you're going to sit down and, and watch a Mavericks-Rockets game on Thursday night? You know, we've been we've been married for uh, <laughs> since 1996 now, for almost 25 years. So yep. she's used to the drill. She's got it. Uh, you know, oftentimes <laughs> we're in separate rooms doing, you know, watching our own thing, which is, which is fine. Uh, yep. We will watch movies and TV shows together for sure. Uh, yeah. The, but, key, the key I've learned is squeeze in a lifetime movie and it buys you a few other movies. Exactly. But I, another most of the time, games rather. Most of the time I'm watching a game uh, as part of my preparation for the next broadcast. So uh, for example, so you I'm can blame it on work. I can't do that. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I just have to be like, game. I'll watch Lifetime with you Friday night if you let me watch this Sixers Rockets game tonight. Right, exactly. So yeah. I wasn't working the Knicks game last night, but I watched because I have the next <laughs> game on Sunday. So I'll always have some kind of a sporting event on in the background. And she watches most of my games uh, on a Sunday. She'll sit home wow. and watch my football games, and uh, and she'll, she'll tell you what you what she liked and didn't like. She does. No, she she's been watching for so long now. So she's she's an excellent critiquer of. Uh, of, of uh, sports play-by-play. You know, we'll have to get into that next time. But, Kenny, you're a great guy. I love having you on the show. Uh, really enjoyed getting to know you. And thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Well, Mike, really appreciate it. Look forward to hopefully seeing you in Philly once uh, once fans are allowed back in the building. Uh, best of luck to your daughter. And uh, uh, let's do this again soon. Absolutely. Everybody, thank you for listening to the podcast and watching. You can see it on YouTube by subscribing to The Painted Lines or following me on Twitter at RealMikeSmall.